Ready, Set, Library. Celebrate National Library Week with us from Sunday, April 7th to Saturday, April 13th. National Library Week recognizes the vital role that libraries play in our society. Enjoy our special programs and recommended books and visit our locations across Queens to discover, learn, and connect. For more information, visit queenslib.org forward slash NLW 2024. Teens, we hope you'll take advantage of this incredible summer opportunity. Queen's Public Library and Toro University are hosting World of Work for Teens, an award-winning service learning program for high school students. Strengthen your professional development skills, get a better understanding of the workplace, and earn college credits and community service hours too. Visit volunteer.queenslibrary.org forward slash World of Work for Teens to learn more. New York City's libraries are facing massive budget cuts. These cuts would force QPL to end Saturday service at most of our branches, reduce our classes and programs, carry fewer books and library materials, and postpone necessary repairs. We need your help. Visit queenslib.org forward slash take action and send a message to your elected officials today. I'm Taylor Purdy, and welcome to Culture Connection. Uh, Culture Connection, if somehow it's your first time, is curated by Daniel Zaleski and is now in its 11th year. We just changed over years about two weeks ago at the Queens Public Library. And we're proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters in disciplines that include music, theater, author talks, movies, and uh, as of today, some, some comedy. Uh, now we've expanded into a virtual format Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. And we've been virtual for a couple of years now. And we're, we're hearing that we're, we're even reaching uh, Japan. People, people watching, you know, early Saturday morning, Queens Public Library talks in Japan. And tonight we have uh, a trifecta where we're mixing it up a little bit. We have actor, comedian, and most recently author of Sure, I'll Join Your Cult, Maria Bamford, comedian Mia Jackson, and thinker, author, David Shoemaker, whose new book drops in about three and a half weeks, Wisecracks, Humor and Morality in Everyday Life, which I'm so curious to hear what that is. Um, but first, <laughs> I just wanted to say um, thank you. Hey, guys. Um, and I just wanted to start with Maria because, you know, you've been tickling me for years. And I'm, I'm, I'm so curious why... Now, you know, I guess, you know, in the last year or two, you decided to look back at everything. Why? Why was it memoir time? Well, they offered me a chunk of money, uh, <laughs> which I share uh, specifically the numbers. Um, if you meet me in person, they would not let me publish it in Simon & Schuster said they would not put, put the actual number. Uh, my book deal is $150,000. I still have not gotten paid for the last chunk. <laughs> it takes six It'd be six years to write it. Uh, that's how book deals work. Just heads up, everybody. Um, it's you might want to keep your day job, uh, but yeah, I say offered me some cash, and uh, because I am uh, like a crow with coin, I uh, yeah said yes. <laughs> so they reached out to you and they said, "Hey, you are getting on. You probably have memories now." I think it's more like. <laughs> Hey, you've got two hundred thousand followers. I think that's all it is. It's all it's a numbers game for follower. Um, I don't I don't want to be. Um, no, I think that's can be the reality of it. And I'm I'm grateful. It was a very um, painful, but also fun pro process for which I was paid handsomely, as I've just shared. Okay. <laughs> um, did, were you ready for that? Not the money, the uh, the going back through your life part. Are we ready? Is work ever seem like a fun idea? No. Nobody wants to go to work. Uh, 
I would rather be at the dog park having the dogs run over me in what I call a love festival where the only ticket is a smile. I I never I, I never want to do anything within the myth of Sisyphus. I am the rock. Uh, <laughs> With pushing me up that hill, I will never gain momentum. Uh, I, so, I feel like you—that's uh, the perfect blend of uh, you knew you had to do comedy for people who watch library talk shows. That <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love to read, and I love Mia's act because you—you you have some great vocabulary in your word in your um, act. Like I love words. I love them so much. Thank you. Oh, yay! You know that I read. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, comedy is so many things to so many people, and I, I certainly do a lot of facial expressions as well as um, modern dance moves uh, on stage uh, when I run out of jokes. But, but I love a well-chosen word. It's really appreciated. Man, do you feel? You're intentionally intentionally literate with <laughs> when you're <laughs> you, you know, yeah, you know what? There are certain times where I will try to say, what's another way I can say this thing? You know, but what's a way that I can say it that one, I I know what I'm I know what I'm talking about so that nobody thinks I'm, you know, I'm trying, I'm still trying to keep it relatable, you know. So cause I, I, there's a joke I used to do a long time ago where I was talking about um being I was talking about dating older, and I said, "What if I date an older man, and then I'd have to go get my medicine from the apothecary?" What? And I just thought it was just fun to say, "Like, what if I'm like apothecary? So much that's more fun than just going. What if I just went to the pharmacy? You know, I'm like, I'm telling you how old I think this person is, and it's, it's a fun <laughs> comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think in one joke you you described a biscuit with a really good word. Um, uh, oh wait, was that the um, the decimated biscuit? Decimated biscuit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was it. Yeah. So with certain uh, things, I'm like, how can I make this impactful with this word? So yeah, I, I try to do it if I can. Yeah. And even if I think if people don't know what something means, they get the rhythm of it, and they're just supposed to laugh unless they're being jerks. I agreed. <laughs> I agree. Being jerks at a at a in a comic situation that sounds like something you probably have to deal with, Dave. When you're well, you guys all the time, but Dave for your for your work. I mean, isn't isn't that kind of what what the new book is dealing with? That it's the morality of what we say and how we say it, like what the rules are. It is, and I should say to start that I my book deal was just remarkably similar to Maria's. I mean, the process that you've described, it's just so resonant with me, except that uh, I have 20 followers, I think, and the advance was zero. But other than that, other yeah. than that, identical. So I, I really appreciate this. It's great to be with a fellow author in these in these ways. Yeah, so I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, focus on a specific kind of humor. And it's, um, I'm sorry, I'll bring the room down a little bit, but I, I, I'm trying to focus on a kind of uh, interpersonal humor and that's where the moral trouble lies. So I'm interested in humor that kind of raises moral questions and moral troubles and worries. And I'm calling these wisecracks. So these aren't jokes, these aren't performed. They, they're, they're mm -hmm. part of just our regular interpersonal life, the kind of back and forth banter and ball busting and so forth that we can engage in with friends and family and colleagues and even enemies. And so, there are things like, um, and I really am interested in talking to Maria about this. Uh, when I'm pulling your leg, for example, I'm intentionally deceiving you. And the funny comes from your being deceived for a little while. It's not funny unless I got you to believe something false for a little while. Or if I mock you, and we mock each other in families a lot, there's a kind of meanness to it. There's a little sting that's involved, but the funny is in the sting. And ordinarily if we don't sting some ordinarily if we're stinging somebody or we're drawing attention to them in a way that's going to be embarrassing or shameful we think that that's there's some moral trouble there but here the, the funny is in the moral trouble um or when we're i'm appealing to some kind of a racial or sexual stereotype in talking with friends ordinarily stereotyping has an immoral element to it but that's what makes the thing funny when it's funny so the book is in part an attempt to try to defend some morally troublesome humor 
And I'm all, also interested in trying to figure out you know, what makes things funny, which is just ridiculously difficult and maybe impossible, and what makes for a good and bad sense of humor and how to improve your sense of humor. So lots of things going on there. And it, it, uh, it raises lots of questions, I think, for both Mia and Maria. Uh, in particular, you know, the kinds of things that you're trying to figure out when you're putting together an act, what's making things funny in the first place, and then as as Mia, you were talking about changing the particular words that you're picking up on, what what words make things funnier and why? Those are the kinds of things that I'm really interested in. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I, I know like one of the common rules of, of, of comedy is that words would like, C and K noise, like anytime you have a, yeah, the- like, Candy corn crunch. Yeah, those are always gonna be better than, um, you know, than, cause sometimes I've had to even change like, oh, well, I wanted to say this, but for the joke, I need to say this other thing and say, cause this sound is gonna hit harder. It's gonna be more, cause people are gonna hear the, <laughs> you know, which yeah. I don't know, sound like I just coughed, but still, but that's what it is. You know, it's it's that, just the, that, the, the, <laughs> sound like hitting that hard sound on a word like will make a joke um because like for example like it's something i'm even i'm working on right now where the other day somebody told me that my name in their country meant stew and he was like yeah, it's a stew it's like a your name it's like it's like it's, but it's like a soup and like as i'm working through it i'm like oh my god is this guy just did he, did he just call me chunky and i'm like he called me thick <laughs> and chunky and then i was like oh thick and chunky is gonna work you know because at first i was yeah. like what if it's what if it's hardy? And I'm like, no, 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 thick. And cause I'm gonna <laughs> hit that thick. And then, you know, I'm like, that's gonna be a better word to make that joke, you know, hit the punchline. So yeah, so just choices like that. And the choices are uh, pertinent to the way in which you typically will deliver a line too. I suppose you're playing to your strengths in the yeah. things that will hit with an audience. Yeah. yeah. And M Maria, you seem to be doing a lot of the similar kinds of things with intonations and the voice work. I mean, the voice work is just spectacular in your in your standup. And I'm wondering what kind of things you're, you're thinking about as you're developing something. Well, I was thinking about the ethical thing. And I, I mean, I love comedy. I even love a well-crafted hate speech. I'll leave the showroom, but um, <laughs> I appreciate the work put in. Um, like, yeah, there's stuff that's not for anybody. You know, is for only for some people. That's it's extremely problematic. Uh, sexist, racist, uh, ableist, homophobic. You know, all the horribles. Um, and at the same time, um, some part of me goes because a, a comedy room can so easily become a fascist event, like where everyone's. <laughs> Like, um, yeah, so, and just on a personal level, my sister asked me for the past 40 years, has asked me not to do jokes about her, 40 years. Mm -hmm. I said every time she asks, but you're so funny. <laughs> and she's my sister and I love her. It has only been within the past year that I have really stopped doing jokes about her. So the ethic of hurting someone directly, <laughs> directly someone who I have a loving relationship, where I've said, ah, oh, go to hell. Um, like, I, uh, yeah, I, I think every- Why did you stop know. finally? Oh, because my parents died. And um, and I she was crying, uh, which she has done before. And I thought, Oh, Maria, do you want to have a relationship with your sister that's rich and deep? And you can, f and I hate to, well, I'll try to swear because I know it's the library, but um, think of the words I might say. Just swear softly. Just swear softly. I'll say, I can write about something else, weirdo. <laughs> like, it, it, you, use your brain. There's a billion things to write about. Uh, you don't just have to write about your sister. Um, and it's true. And and I have really uh, doubled down on the topic of personal finance in my current hour. <laughs> I, I, I so appreciated that about the book. I mean, you're so forthcoming about it. And I could just see editors screaming at the kinds of things that you're <laughs> revealing. 
I've started paying people people in the audience if I do crowd work with them, uh, because I think that's the invisible work that is not being recognized. <laughs> Really? <laughs> really? Changed. Oh my God, Mia, it changes the vibe in the room so fast. What? In and out 20s. Oh my God. People are like, what? <laughs> oh my God. That's that's great. Final exploited <laughs> pew. So, but Marie, you oh. also do, I've, I've seen on X and Twitter, or X Twitter, whatever, that you will ask people to do a one on one with them. Yes. And you talk about this in, in the book as well, that you give them a t shirt or something. Uh, if they sit with you for 40 minutes or something and you go over new material. I mean, how how valuable is that feedback, though? I mean, there's this kind of social pressure that's one on one with Maria Bamford that you're going to be laughing at things you might not laugh at at a comedy club. Can you get genuine feedback from these one on one sessions? Well, the reason, and I have a very individual reason for getting into comedy. I like the perceived sense of control. I also like making myself laugh. Those are my two reasons. I do not care that much whether other people find it funny. I genuinely, it's, that's not the highest thing on my list. So uh, what I try to get is, yeah, somebody to listen. I already think it's hilarious. Um, I just need to practice it. Um, so I'm a theatrical performer. I'm not uh, necessarily an improviser. Um, though I have taken improv classes and gone through all six levels and done live street oh. improv. Um, <laughs> I looked just now to see if there was a person on this <laughs> feed when I heard that voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I am deaf. I create safe spaces. Like I, Mia goes up at the comedy cellar. I never go up there. It's a super tough room for me. I will bomb guaranteed, guaranteed. I will bomb every night of the week. And uh, I no longer want to make people have a terrible time, much less myself. Um, so I just, I'm the hothouse flower of comedy. I create Certain, I go up at I look in my neighborhood in LA. I put go up at this clown theater. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute! Oh, what's clowning? Um, it's stand up with nudity, cry, crying, and a considerable lack of consent. Uh, they get up in your business <laughs> with you, and it's confusing. <laughs> oh it's wow! French. <laughs> French. <laughs> That sounds better than a bar show. Right? <laughs> I, I mean, mean. I, I love watching shows at the Comedy Cellar. I love watching people get heckled. I love people dealing with, uh, yeah, it's just, it's not my personal sense of joy. Um, it usually gets sort of existential when I get heckled. Like, what? what are you doing here? I know what I'm doing here. I know why I'm here. I made a choice. But at this point, you really, you're committed to suffering. And that, you know, and I, that's exciting for me to hear because there are, because sometimes I go through this thing where I'll go, well, I should go perform wherever anybody asks me to go. And then other times I've gone, wait, I don't have to do this to myself. I don't like that place. I don't have to, I don't have fun there. Why am I doing this to myself? So it, I'm so happy to, to hear that, to go, oh, that's fine that I think that. That's I okay. Refuse, I refuse to do benefits anymore because the person who hi mm. hires you is a big, I got hired last one I did, schizophrenia research. Person who hired me, very big fan because he has schizophrenia. We should have just had lunch. Um, the opener was Yamanika Saunders, insanely oh, yeah. talented community. She's so funny. Yeah, she, yes, she, yeah. she had people on their feet with laughter. Yes, I go that. up, yeah. um, people start clapping me off after about five minutes in a way that suggests that they either think that I'm done or they hope that I'm done. Because this is a bunch of wealthy yoga winos in Napa Valley, California. And, <laughs> um, and then I had to explain them that, no, I got to do a half hour more. And now we're all uh, in pain on behalf of Parkinson's reacher. What's going on? <laughs> I'm trying to do harm reduction with comedy. Harm reduction. Oh, that's so. 
So the Yamanika will tell you, oh my God, she came up to us, she's just like, well, we were laughing. And that's <laughs> what you <laughs> Yeah, when another comic, when another comic is like, listen, I got it. Then you're always like, oh, oh no. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> no one else. <laughs> Oh. I was drinking like one of those little tiny like bottles of wine at the Hampton Inn. <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. I've had I've had those nights. Yeah. 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 Um, Dave, yeah. have you tried stand-up or improv? I did it once uh with a friend of mine, and it was a total disaster. I mean a total disaster. And so I said never again. So I, I ha just have such great admiration for the people who get up and bomb and they say, yeah, this is this is making me want to do this some more because it was just <laughs> humiliating. And the only funny bit came from uh, somebody in the audience who got to a better punchline than I was getting to. And I said, <laughs> oh, no, no, oh, no, this sounds... is not for me. Not for me. <laughs> Philosophy. There's the life. There's the life. <laughs> Philosophy. Well, it is so interesting about the kidding culture, which I I feel like I always say, oh, you're just kidding? Oh, then I'm just kicking. I'm just kicking you in the shins. Hope that doesn't bother you. Um, but because I sometimes I have a hard time with comedians. I always feel like there is some truth behind Like if somebody talks about hitting their wife, He's hitting his wife, you know, like, like, and I don't, I know that's not always a hundred percent true. Sometimes people are doing right. it, true, but I just, I don't know. There is, there is some ethical thing where I go, um, you know, say, oh, I raped this girl on a thing that there's a lot of rape culture jokes. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, I know the, where you're watching yeah. and you're like, oh, this is, you're just hiding in plain sight with that joke, you know, that, that kind of thing where you're like, oh, sure, it's a joke, you know, that, yeah, that's, that happens, yeah, a lot, and, and, and some people, you, yeah. You and there's it. no uh, policing co co comedy rooms, so watch your back, watch your back at a comedy show, <laughs> that I try to put a, an asterisk by sex offenders in the, uh, in the green room, but. Uh, On the lineup? <laughs> this is making my this is the best thing that I'm I'm not, I'm not even gonna go do my spot now. This is the best thing. This is, I'm learning so much. This is the best information I've gotten all day. Yes. I, I love it. Love it. Love it. That's you with people I, just whisper. <laughs> that's can I ask you both? Oh go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Please. Well, I I want to ask you both about um Maria puts it as um punching up the truth and i mentioned this earlier where it's it's in a way it goes beyond kind of comic exaggeration to you're just telling outright lies about your life but you're telling them in a way that you know people maybe you know, they can suss out that you're just kind of joking around but some people do take away from that i imagine that the things that you are claiming happened to you actually did happen to you and the reason i the reason i raise this is because it's related to um the recent hassan minaj uh, hmm. um, sort of kerfuffle where um, he was being blamed for telling tall tales about his prom date, uh, turning him down on the day of the prom because his par because her parents didn't want him uh, her to be seen with, a, as he put it, a brown boy, and that um, he pranked someone from Homeland Security on after 9-11. So he, what he said was that these are fibs in service of an emotional truth, is how he put it. I'm wondering about <laughs> lines, if there are any here, and um, how you go about making funny out of things that are happening in your life, trying to preserve maybe some kind of truth or maybe not trying to preserve some kind of truth, and um, what kinds of things that you feel you'd be okay just outright fibbing about. <sighs> <laughs> Deadly silence. This is this is why I quit stand up. Okay, this is okay. I'll I'll say okay because that's it's a so for me I I usually try I try to talk about things that happened for real and then I may exaggerate the moment in in a joke and I'm fine with with doing that because there are things where in real life. You know, if I'm having this experience, you know, let's say I'm having some customer service exchange with someone where 
I think the thing is funny enough, but maybe for the joke, I might go, well, you know, even though I did say this thing, I might just add another thing that I wish I had said, you know, but I'm still in the, the whole thing for the most part is, is, is true. But for me, it, it, for me, it's very difficult to just make up something out of nothing. Like that's really hard for me as a comic, because I'm like, and I've had, you know, like family members or friends who think they know, and they'll be like, you know, they know comedy and they'll go, I think you should talk about this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but that didn't, that didn't happen. And I'm like, that didn't happen to me. Or even though that's your story, I'm like, I can't, I can't make that into a joke for me because I'm not personally connected to it in any way. So right. that's why it's harder for me. I don't do a lot of observational humor. I, I do some, but it'll have to be something that happened that day where I'm like, oh, I have this thing that I'm going to talk about just right now, but then I might not ever talk about it again. But, but most things for me, I try to go, this feel, this, this is a real thing that happened. And I'm exaggerating, but I can't, you know, and I might change a name around because, you know, like Marie was saying, like it's certain, you know, like maybe my sister doesn't want her, <laughs> you know, me to be saying her full name mm -hmm. for the public. So I might, you know, my cousin doesn't want me to know that, you know, I might have to change something about a family member, you know, so those kind of things, like I will, you know, I will change some stuff around, but there are some jokes where I am purposely being like, uh-huh, like just playing like that didn't happen, you know, and then get to the rest of what actually happened in the, in the joke. And so the biscuit story did happen. Oh, the biscuit story absolutely yeah. happened. It was that straight up like for, for those of you who want to go watch the joke, but no, I am, um, no, I, I really did. I was in a relationship with, with a, with a man where we already hated each other at this point. And um, <laughs> we straight up argued because he, he accused me of stepping on a biscuit. Like the biscuit was crumbled and he was like, you did it. You took it out of the box, you put it on the floor. And I was like, why would I do that? And like years later, I'm telling somebody else that story. And they were like, do you talk about that on stage? Because who would do that? Like that can't be a real story. And I'm like, they were like, tell me what actually happens. So when I, I just told it exactly like it happened. And then I went, oh, you know what? Let me heighten certain parts of it for yeah. the joke. But this man really did think that I crush the biscuit and then try to get it to him. And I'm like, I'm not I'm like, I don't like you, but I'm not crazy. Like, and also who has the time? Who has the time? I didn't even have time to step on it before I brought it inside the house. And I liked your point that it was a Popeye's biscuit and it was yeah. not uh, one of the better biscuits with filled with cheese. No cheese. Right. It, wasn't a, it wasn't a red lobster biscuit. Like that, I fight over that. But like Popeye's, did, I like Popeye's, but it's dry. You gotta put honey on it to make it acceptable. <laughs> You know, <laughs> uh, I, I I can relate with what Mew was saying. Like, yeah, I I, I want to make it as true as possible, but I know that I've made. I had something a story about a college situation uh, ad, and I instead wrote it from the point of view that it was just me being there because I thought it was complicated to also include that I had, and also seemed less hilarious if I had a friend there with me but also maybe that maybe I'm wrong you know like sometimes I think maybe the exact thing that happened is the funniest thing um so but I've definitely uh I've made up things completely that my mother never said mm -hmm. um yeah but it would be funny if she said it in the voice that you have her, yeah. Um, let me see, what did I, I mean, my mom said things like, honey, your breath is bad. Um, but uh, uh, that was on her deathbed when she, she leaned in and she said, your breath is terrible. All right, love you, mom. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but, like what are the things? Yeah, like certain things. Like I have a, I do a call that she she loved customer service. She would spend hours on a phone call. Like she just, she just loved talking to people. And so I made up this, you know, whole phone call, you know, that I've never heard her do. And um, it's in the spirit of what I've heard her say. You know, I'm talking to India. <laughs> Um, but, um, but what wouldn't you do? I mean, especially me, a lot of what you just described is 
it's performance and process based. Like you don't do it because for you, it's better to speak from your experience. But where is the line? I mean, I think up against it. Relationships, friends, things. If I don't have a, a um, if I don't have a horse in the race, like if I've never had the personal experience of something, I don't talk about it. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to you know, guess what I think about this thing I've never <laughs> gone yeah. through. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. And I and I because I, I remember watching someone years ago and um, and I just knew like when I was watching, I was like, man, I was like, this person is so funny. And they were talking about all this stuff in their family and all this other stuff. And then. It was just something about it where to me, I was like, I don't think they're married. I don't think they have kids. And I just knew it. I just felt it. And then like later on, I'm talking to them and I'm like, oh, like you're not married, are you? And they go, how'd you know? Hmm. Oh my God. You know, and they, they were just like, I, I just, I don't know. I think I just, it was just something I could just, I could just tell. And even though the jokes, very funny, hilarious. Hmm. The jokes were really, really funny, but I was like, mm, something. There was just something that did not, something was just a little off. And then I was like, I was right. Like, oh my God, I was right. You know? And so it, so it would be hard for me to be like, guys, my husband, and I don't have one, <laughs> you know, like that would be very difficult for me to, to, to do on stage. Like that would, I could not, I couldn't, do, it would be very hard for me because I'm not connected to it. Yeah. I know there's some philosophy of like that's kind of like a vaudeville philosophy where it's like there are certain jokes and they are owned by everybody. You know, right. like somebody goes, oh, I heard that, then I'm going to use it. And then like so there's also that philosophy of like nothing is owned by anyone um, and you can mm -hmm. cover somebody else's joke. Um, I, I'm not uh, I don't I'm not a fan, but I also think. There are only there's limits to the human experience, and so um, we're all going to be talking about the same things, pretty much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. Those would be more like structure, though, a, a structure of a joke that you could then adapt to a variety of experiences. Or you're nope. thinking, you're just thinking you specific just kinds of experiences. Line for line, word for word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Wow. oh. Like like stock jokes, <laughs> okay. Yeah, like stock material that's just out in the in the atmosphere because. I've, you know, I've been on the road before and yeah. heard somebody close with, I'm like, oh, I remember that joke from an uh, email chain 10 years ago. You know, like those those kind of jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, what did you, a crowd joke, you know, what did you just come in town for supplies? Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, isn't there a curfew at the whorehouse? <laughs> yeah. All right. Come on, buddy. Right. <laughs> I use these in class sometimes. They're they're it's golden because <laughs> they're so they're, they're, the structure's there. The structure's great. Like it has all the elements yeah. of surprise and everything. You know, it's just yeah belongs to the world. I like I like that you said that it's a it's a vaudevillian idea that, because it's like the, the folk music of comedy. The things that have been mm -hmm. with us so long that you don't even know who should get credited for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like all that, that, some of the internet where people get really whipped up of like, they stole my <laughs> stripper uh, dance into a sad song. I think that, I think <laughs> that idea has been out there. Right, like that. I mean, it's great. Right. It's Le Miserat, you know, whatever you, I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but I mean that the comparison that Taylor made to music, I think I find really interesting. And I know musicians worry about things. They've heard so much music that they worry that some of the things that they're writing, it's really being funneled from something else that they've heard. I mean, it's occasionally come out in lawsuits, but I mean, uh, more plausibly, I think that there's just some kind of hook or a phrase or something or a, a, a nice little structure of a of a joke that maybe came from somewhere else that they thought was original. I mean, I wonder, do you have these kinds of worries and what do you do to root them out, if anything? One thing headliners will sometimes do is go, hey, don't cover these topics before me, uh -huh. which I, oh. I'm i against, because I just think develop the shit out of your own material, you know, like make it so bizarre or, or just even for that one show, you can amp up whatever you have or like ha use your creativity. Like don't limit another performer by saying, oh, you, yeah, please don't do anything about dogs 
for relationships. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 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 And I've, I've had people tell me that before, you know, a show like, oh, you know, I, I know you're going to like, don't I heard you last night. So I'm doing this tonight. I'm like, OK, you know, mm-hmm. but I'm, when yeah. I, yeah, but when it's I, funny. yeah, it's, yeah. 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 Um, I don't like to tell people what they can and, and can't do. The only, only time I try to give anybody any kind of notes is if I'm working somewhere where they've said, oh, well, you know, they want everybody to be relatively cleaner mm-hmm. on this right. show. You know, something yeah. like that, I'll just go, hey, let me give you a heads up. They said PG-13, PG-18, so whatever you got within those parameters, do that. But I'm not going to say, please, for the love of God, if you were talking about biscuits, <laughs> you're not talking about How dare you? Don't step on my biscuit, <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> right. Don't you do it. Yeah, like I don't, I just, yeah. Because because then I come, because you can even refer back to that person like, hey, look, they were talking about me. Let me tell you what happened with me. Like, here's my story. You know, you could just do that instead of yeah. telling them not to do it at all. Yeah. Have you ever gone back and listened to someone, you know, a set from back in the day? I mean, like an old record set. I mean, like, oh, shit, that's where I got that. I didn't even know that David Pryor said that. My rhythm is all from Steve Martin. Like I, mm-hmm. I listened to him as a lot as a kid. Do you do you ever rediscover like oh that of course I got that from Steve Martin? That you like maybe new in the era and then years pass and you re remember that you stole it or were inspired by it. I don't think I stole, but just definitely the rhythms of people. Okay. I I definitely uh, and let me see and I mean, my my family and my parents and if I tour with some of my friend Jackie Cation we get each other's ry- rhythms if we do a ton of shows together <laughs> so I can do a she can do an impersonation of me and vice versa so man yeah, do you, do you, does that ever happen to you yeah, yeah if I um yeah I've, I've I'm trying to think like there was because when I first started stand-up I mean I used to watch a lot of um like Chris Rock's probably my favorite comic. So I would watch a lot of Chris Rock. So if I would be sitting around with my, you know, like at the time, I think I only admitted to maybe my aunt that I wanted to do stand up, And I'd be like, this is a joke idea I have. And she'd be like, girl, you sound like Chris Rock. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, I gotta sound like myself, you know, but it was good for her to say like, like, she was like, your whole, like the way you told that thing to me, like you sounded exactly like the way he sounded. You know, I'm not, not saying I was, I'm doing brilliant material like that, but she was like, you sound, you know, that way. But it was really, you know, it was a good thing for me to go, oh, let me make sure that when I'm watching people, I'm just, I'm just studying to understand structure and style and all these other kind of things, but I still have to develop my own thing on stage. Well, I mean, I guess that's a, a trap for young performers, no matter what they're performing, that that sense of that moment of right before and or after you find your own voice. And there's so much before for so many people. Um, well, that's why you can't put all your self-esteem in what your job is. Uh, spread it out. Put some <laughs> of your eggs in, in different baskets. The dogs for are the dogs sure. Are. Really? Yeah. I'm I take yeah. real pride in my ability to chit chat. And uh cross <gasps> over there. You know, I I'm like, Dale Carnegie. I'm like a professional Walmart greeter in my neighborhood. <laughs> um uh, I mean so Kind of to that point about, you know, socializing IRL, I'm curious because we were talking about, you know, Maria, your sister, and when you decided to leave her out of the jokes or not. But I'm imagining that when you guys were starting out, maybe even before you found your own rhythms, there must have been points where maybe you were ribbing a little too hard or crossing a line. Or I'm wondering, like, in relation to Dave's work, when you start to realize maybe you're being a little harsh, in, like socially, how how you craft the being a funny gal to your neighbors versus not being a dick to your neighbors. It still happens. Like when I start at the beginning of a joke, like I usually start from a place of, sometimes I come start from a place of anger. And uh, yeah, I usually start as the victim of something. And I'm trying to not do that anymore to go, yeah, no, I'm 54. Uh, that's dumb. And uh, but yeah, I've just had a, a recent thing that I've changed where it's like trying to make it clear um, 
yeah, that I, I not wanting to make the other person look like a, a demon or demonize, yeah, demonize someone else. Um, Cause I, I don't know if that's necessary uh, for comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can still recognize the funny in it. Well, I don't. I do, Dave. As I said, I'm a very big fan of my own work, mm -hmm. and <laughs> as well you should be. <laughs> yeah. I, so now, to to your point, Maria, I um, because there there's a a joke that I had where I, I was like, oh, you know what? I need to just acknowledge in this joke that. I'm not the good person here. I was like, I'm, I'm very bad. I'm like, I did something really horrible, and I just say that and go like, listen, guys, that that was on me. I'm not. That did not make me look great, and I'm just gonna acknowledge that I'm I'm bad here. I made a mistake, you know. So and I, but it but it but it was fun to go. You know what? I think I think I think before I would have been like, well, no, I I can yell at this person in this joke. I'm on my high horse, and then I'm like. No, you were mean. You were really mean, and you need to tell people you weren't being great at this moment. And so, and there are other people that there are people in the audience that can relate to. Oh my God, I'm also like that. I'm not always a good person, or I've always, or I've made some choices in this same kind of scenario where I might have thought I was right, but looking at it through the lens of somebody else, I made a, I'm, I'm garbage. <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens, not always, but it happens sometimes. With, with hecklers, sometimes I'm not, I get really scared. My whole body freezes up. And, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm trying as I get older to have more curiosity about what is actually happening. Because sometimes mm -hmm. I've reacted in such a mean way. And the person's been like, it's my birthday. I just was making noises and I couldn't control myself. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, um, yeah, so just that, like who who knows what's happening in the audience to just right. be. Yeah. You know. Dave, I'm curious if comedy can be angry. And a lot of times we learn how to be funny when we're very, very young. And I'm curious about, I mean, did, did you ever have to like look at kids in the, how we teach each other what a joke is and how often the like the child version of that is just was always going too far. Yeah. So um, what's interesting about that is that there were there are some people who think that there's no such thing as a good or bad sense of humor. There's just different senses of humor. And so it's kind of a radical relativism, which I just don't buy. And that's because I think that kids make really terrible knock knock jokes when they're so if you look at the development of the humor sensibility it gets better and we know ways in which it gets better and we can teach ways in, in which it gets better and so i think they start off with these kind of they get they listen to rhythm first and um so that's why the knock knock joke they've got that kind of rhythm and they've got the the, the starting premise they've got that all there and then the rest of it can be utter nonsense but it fits into the rhythm of the joke and eventually you get to a point where as empathy develops, then they're better at kind of riffing and going back and forth in this kind of affiliative way that I'm most interested in. And, but it, it, it requires these kinds of development of moral capacities too, I think. So it's really fascinating to see kind of uh, developmental psychology of humor in um, kids. It's also really fascinating for me to see personality disorders and their humor styles. And so psychologists have done a lot of studying of psychopaths and narcissists and Machiavellians that are together called the dark triad. Machiavellians like pulling people's puppet strings to cause conflict and it's funny for them. And right. they're attracted to a very distinctive kind of extremely aggressive humor. So it's almost exclusively put downs and sarcasm and ridicule and so forth. And so that's correlated really negatively with well-being. They don't live very good lives, but the stuff that's really correlated positively with well-being is the kind of thing that Maria was talking about, as well as Mia in talking about, um, I'm gonna tell the story where I turned out to be the bad person here. And it's a kind of self-deprecatory humor. And so people sympathize with that and they can identify with that. And you have more friends typically as a result. So both of these pressures I think are, coming from development and also different kinds of personality disorders that affect people's senses of humor in interesting ways. Dave, I'm going to argue with you. 
Okay, uh, good. That um, puns, uh, fart noises, uh, knock knock jokes, still good. Still oh good. yes, good. I'm not denying that. Good. I'm not denying that. That's <laughs> not that's not a there lower form of comedy. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm glad you pushed back on that. No, I'm saying that kids that are 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 uh, developing that kind of humor, they're bad at it at first, and they no, get better at it. We'll tell them, uh, and they get better at it with various other oh, kinds okay, of capacity. Yeah. And so I'm totally down with a oh, I see. good pun. I think. I do think pranks are the lowest form of humor, but I think a good pun is always that can carry the day. <laughs> I, I I'm a I'm a I'm a punny person myself. I, I definitely I feel you on that. Um, I think we're gonna start getting some questions in. Um, but you know, just as they as they come. Um, but I I am curious, Dave. Um why you wanted to do this <laughs> where did this idea come from so um I, you know, I have very funny friends and i like hanging around those friends and i like riffing with those friends and we do this quite a bit and it's incredibly enjoyable and i was interested as philosophers are want to do to try to theorize about it and think uh, more abstractly about it and render it completely unfunny but um all of the liter all of the work that's been done on humor in psychology and philosophy and other disciplines has been about jokes. Hmm. And I'm really interested in this much more impersonal give and take back and forth because that's where the interesting moral issues are. So I just found myself writing because no one else had about this particular kind of thing. And uh, it took me down a rabbit hole that I'm really glad I went down. So in the midst of a pandemic, it was the most hilarious and fun time I've ever had. As oh, a, well, that's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the questions that are coming in are about uh, your performance on the audiobook, Maria. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm this is one of the things I wanted to get into with you guys is the line between the, your stand up selves and your I'm being an actor today self. Um, just, I mean, is are those different skill sets it's, and parts for you? Well, I've cleaned houses, so I guess it's like going, oh, I'm cleaning houses today. Or I'm uh, gonna uh, uh, rake leaves today. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. It's just I, I accept it. It's a lot better paying. Let, let's just say that it is a union <laughs> job. But like raking leaves, it's a different part of yourself than stand up. Is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's good, it's good. But I always want to emphasize just because the arts or certain jobs are put on these platforms and it's just like throughout history, prestige, money and success has never brought people happiness. <laughs> I just <laughs> want to make that clear. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I just, I, yeah, the, I, I just it, sometimes I think you know oh being good at something doesn't mean it, it brings happiness. I don't know why I, I'm obsessed with that topic just because I think really? Los Angeles there's a lot of young people going oh I'm gonna feel good when I get to this point. It's like no you won't. If you don't feel good now, you won't feel good then. When did you um, figure out what your feel good level was? Um, I think when I first got uh, antipsychotics. Uh, that was, uh, I got well medicated and that was a real uh, game changer. Spread the word. <laughs> um, Mia, have you, do you feel similarly about the stand up versus when you're, even, even like improv stuff, that line between the stand up self and the more traditional actor performer self? Um, do I think there's a lie? Yes. Or what, a, what it feels like for you. There's a, there's a, yeah, like for me, um, when I think about who I am on stage, I just feel like it's just maybe a more amplified version of offstage Mia, you know, and I, why am I talking about myself in third person? I think it's because I have on a shirt with a collar. Um, I, think, <laughs> so I just, I, know, I was like, that's why I'm doing this. I'm like, I, I'm like, I have on my collared shirt. I'm 
feeling really important right now. But um, but I do find like when I am with, you know, family and people that I grew up with and friends, like people that know me, they know that like, well, humor has always been a part of your personality and how you relate to people. But then like if those people, if my friends bring around some other friend or if my family member brings around, oh, it's my, it's my new girlfriend, it's my new boyfriend, blah, 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 that's my, my cousin, she's a, she's, she's a comedian, you know, then people are like, ooh, so what's going to happen? And I'm like, we're at Thanksgiving. I just want to eat, <laughs> you know, like, I, don't, I don't have a set, you know, and so, 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 I've, so I've had people, you know, kind of do that thing where they're like, you're going to be like, she's going to be on, you know, and I'm like, no, I'm still just here with everybody else just with i'm just hanging out i'm like if you want to see a set i can show you a clip but there's a difference between you know I'm like you'll see bits of this there but it's just more amplified in the performance space sure if, if, if you want people to not talk to you like on airplanes and so forth tell them that you're a philosopher every time you know thank you know i need a new job <laughs> to tell uber drivers so that's good okay there you I'm go with, there you go i go with consultants there you so go. that's good all right i will say bookkeeper which i do do my own books and so i'll deep dive with people on quickbooks if they're interested and that's why you're so into personal finance comedy these days oh god i freaking i you know i do not know what i'm talking about but i love to go on and on and on <laughs> Um, we've got a question about the uh, the relationship between stand up and performance art, um, and you know when you when you're doing stand up, you are still kind of like you were saying, of, you know, you're being a version of Mia. But which buttons to push when you're heightening the self, but as opposed to acting when you're not supposed to be yourself? Oh gosh. Can you repeat the question? Somehow my brain just left the room. Yeah. What makes the difference between comedy and performance art? Um, cares about character and personality is eccentric. I don't think I think about it that hard. Uh, yeah, a lot of comedy is just excitement for when the French fries are coming after the show. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's so much good food in comedy clubs, I gotta tell you. Deep <laughs> fried. Deep <laughs> fried. So good. Wings. Oh. Wings. Come on. Come on. <laughs> and uh -oh. we're and we're comedians, so we get as many wings as we want. And well, in fact, everybody out there, you might get paid in wings if you start stand up. So, <laughs> don't you miss that opportunity to get into this business? <laughs> wings and drink tickets. That's what you get. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, um uh, another question from the audience. Um at what point do Talking about your lives in public is a unique thing. And at what point does that become group therapy for everybody? And is the is there a line between the, this is acceptable group ther therapy and like, now we're talking about something dark, but we're all going to, you're going to listen to me right now. And th that can be freeing to talk about something so private, so publicly. I like talking about certain things just because it, it's meaningful to me, I'm, you know, if I've been through something that was taboo for me, um, then I feel like somehow I'm useful in talking about it. Because even if somebody, nobody laughs, if someone feels less alone, like I, I feel weirdly useful. I mean, I, that's probably some weird Jehovah Witnesses thing of like, I'm abused through Christ. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, I just, <laughs> um, nothing against Jehovah Witnesses. I've heard they have a great roller skating parties. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, it makes me feel like somehow useful. Um, but, uh, you know, I also think comedy isn't for that always. You know, people just want to be entertained, which is fine. Um, but 
<laughs> Yamanika, she introduced me on that one show. Is everybody ready to have a good time? I am not a good time. I am. <laughs> I'm an assignment from a therapist. I'm some someone other comedians go to see and go, huh? Um, I can fill a room in Portland on a Thursday. <laughs> so was this the were these the combination of elements that you think went into the writing of the book? That there's this you want to be of some use, and you're talking about a variety of the twelve step yes. programs you went to, but also entertaining. Um, but at the end of the day, maybe I want to be really of use. Of use and 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 then and and it's not for everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! Put down the book. Put down that book if you do not like it. Um, that's what always makes the review culture. I always go. You know, once you started getting mad, you could have <laughs> left the building. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Like. And what's interesting is that. <laughs> these aren't six these aren't success stories <laughs> Shoot, uh, as would be be the case for a lot of uh these uh, of, of somebody who's motivated to write a book like that it's it, it wasn't transformative any of these things weren't terribly transformative in the way that i'd kind of hoped which is i think a really fascinating takeaway well i think it's, i really despise a book that says Oh, this is what happened. And if you do it right, then you're gonna feel you're gonna have bliss. Because <laughs> I have I've just that has not been my life experience at all. Um, so I'd never want to give anybody um that that story. Um yeah, I, I I've gotten help, but it's been shitty, half-assed uh help from all different sources, not necessarily professional, sometimes uh Burger King. Well, to, to that point, there's another question about the line between good mental help and bad mental help. How can you tell the difference? When do you know if you're in the right space? I think it's in the eyes of the beholder. I don't believe there are safe spaces at all. Like, especially when somebody says, this is a safe space, I go, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. To hold me at the small of my back. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I just don't think that's a thing. I don't think that's real. Um, you just, yeah, trust yourself, how you feel. You can always leave, um, if you don't like something. And if you don't, like, if you're at a, if you're a comedian and you don't like the open mics, sometimes, sometimes people say, oh, I don't like the open mics because they feel mostly male, uh, heteronormative, etc. Make your own space. Uh, do shows in your living room. Uh, that's what I did. I yeah, and I still do. We do an open mic in my living room, in our living room every once in a while. Uh, so did you always realize you really that? come. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. You, you you really just on on the therapy. You really do come down pretty hard on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. It seems, which surprised me a bit. So, I'm, <laughs> no, no good. For psychiatric illness, if it's severe, like to give someone a book, a workbook and say, if you change your thoughts, you can change your life. Go to hell. Like, no. <laughs> like at that point, I need to be hit in the head with a sharp object that I don't see coming. I don't need a fucking telephone book sized thing with blank things to fill out. Um, the last two questions that I think we have time for are, uh, one's heavy and one's a great way out. Um, uh, but because so many of you know, so many books in the, in the room thoughts on the, on the book bands and the somehow the overly frequently connected, uh, bands of like drag queen library hour, um, which I didn't realize was such a common thing until I read about how many of them were getting closed down. And it kind of just made sense to me that that would be a great story hour. Um, Mia, have you performed in Florida? Do you perform a lot in the South or? Oh, my, I was in Florida earlier this year and I was like, this might be enough for me. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it was, I'm from the South, I'm from Georgia originally, but 
Florida. I mean, there was a, I won't say the joke here. There was a joke. And I said this one thing, I mean, I'll just say it. I said the word slave owner in the joke and mm -hmm. just silence. Like everybody mm -hmm. was like, this is, why would she say that? And then I finally was like, oh, that's right. It's been deleted out of your books. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> do you? you don't know this word. You haven't heard this word at all. This is not my fault. This is your fault. You got this wrong. Me. You're wrong. <laughs> you know, and yeah. So, so, so to that point, I say, I don't think, I mean, I don't think we need to ban, you know, like we don't need to ban books. We don't need to ban drag queen story hour. I've done drag. I've gone to drag queen bingo. It's fun. Why would you not want to hear a drag queen read a story to you? It's exciting. It's a good time. It's not hurting anybody. And I think it's important just to like, how are we, if we are banning books, how are we going to let people like, you have to, you have to learn. You have to know what happened previously. You have to know about how context changes over time, just how you know, these different historical moments. You, it's just all of these things that are so important to go, oh, this is how this thing, this was a moment in time where somebody wrote this book about this thing and how people sounded, how people talked. And now this is how things are now, but this happened because of this thing back here, you know, and, and you can't, like, we can't lose that. Like you have to know what happened. You have to read, and that's how we grow. So, so as I, clearly this is a child who read a lot, I read a lot of books as a child, so I got, I just very passionate about this. Like, why would you do this? It, it, it bothers me so much. So let people read. Yeah. And if you read, I mean, particularly re religious texts, the Bible, if you've ever read that back to back, so disturbing. I mean, some of that's like, uh, uh, that should be behind lock and key. Um, very uh, odd. Uh, so that's about all the time we have, though. Uh, the last question is favorite places to perform. Do you guys have a favorite, any favorite clubs? I wonder if there's crossover between you guys. <laughs> I love how we went from book bands to, hey, guys, let's have a good time. Um, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I love, I mean, I'm, since, I'm, since I've been in New York, I love uh, the Comedy Cellar. Um, that's that's why I'll be tonight. I uh, love the Comedy Cellar. New York Comedy Club is a good time. Um, it's just there's so many great places in New York City to see comedy. And then when I'm on the road, I've had like my, my home club punchline in Atlanta. Always a good time. So uh, Zany's in Nashville. It's just so many, so many great places all, all over to perform. So good. Um, yeah, I like, I, I, I'm also like, like kind of alternative things where it's like in theaters and stuff. So I, I, the Brooklyn Comedy Collective is a great place to go, really inexpensive shows. And, um, and you can also rent the space if you want to put up your own show. Um, and um, let me see, I love open mics. I love an open mic. Uh, you just never know what you're going to see. I saw, uh, last time I saw a senior citizen black man do a misogynist rhyming act that was also body positive. No! <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around any of that. that makes perfect sense. <laughs> oh, but I need to see it. I need to see it. <laughs> and, and I was like, um, you must have an album. He does not have an album, uh, but hopefully he'll get. My God, get so was he, he was he rapping? Is that what? I'm yeah, it was kind of oh. like a it was kind of like a rap, but also he was older, so it was kind of like a yeah. It was it wasn't quite rap, but it was thing. Yeah, rhyming. It was very is, very fun. I am. I didn't, I didn't realize I'll, be, I'll be appearing. I'll be appearing at uh, Rockefeller Hall, at Cornell, Cornell University, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I, I welcome you. My, my setups are much longer than yours, and my punchlines are more like thinkers. But uh, you know, just like what you do. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, got, thanks for thanks for doing this, the three of you. Um, Maria's book is out right now. Dave's book is out in a month. And Mia is at the Comedy Cellar tonight. If you're in New York City. Um, so thanks. Um, yeah, I, I was not sure where the literary comedy line was going to be, but then you opened with Sisyphus. I was like, ah, okay. These three. Are the <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Taylor. Thanks to the library.
Don't buy my book. Get it at the library. <laughs> get the audiobook at the library. Yeah. yeah. 